Welcome to the Supported Living Property Podcast with your host, me, Lisa Brown, the place to learn about supported living property investing. Hi Deirdre, it's great to have you here today. Thank you very much for having me. (laughs) That's great. Um, For people who don't know you, do you want to introduce yourself and tell people a bit about you? Yeah, so my name is Deidre Cartwright and I work for Standing Together, which is a national domestic abuse organisation. And a part of that is the Domestic Abuse Housing Alliance or called DOHA. Um, And I am a private rented sector development manager with DOHA. Um, Just to tell you a bit about myself, um, my background is that I have worked in the domestic abuse sector for about 10 years now. So I started off in London working directly with um, individuals experiencing domestic abuse um, and supporting them as an independent domestic violence advocate. So working with them to access the support and services that they need to become safe whether that's the criminal and civil um, justice system, police, um, medical professionals, children's social care, whatever it is they need to become safe, I would support them to do that. Um, And then I moved into more strategic work, um, developing policies and um, practice around how all different professionals and agencies can come together to respond more effectively to domestic abuse within each of their professional capacities. So if you're a housing provider, what's your role? Um, If you're in the police or um, you work in a hospital, what's your role in response to domestic abuse? And how do we do that in a coordinated way? Um, And that's how I came to Standing Together and DOHA um, to look specifically at what is the role of housing providers in response response to domestic abuse and how can we help them improve their response and ensure policy helps them do that as well. Fantastic and so it's actually working with landlords and the private rental sector as well isn't it what is so that's that's something that's a bit different I think in in that approach isn't it to to actually engaging with private landlords and their role within it. Yeah Um, definitely it's a very new approach so I think historically within the domestic abuse sector it's been very focused on social housing as um I guess the main housing providers who need to have a response to domestic abuse, I guess mainly because there's always been an emphasis that survivors when they're experiencing domestic abuse need to be the ones to leave, that they have to give up their home, that they have to become homeless, that they have to seek accommodation elsewhere in order to um, become safe from the abuse. But we're trying to really change that narrative and do everything we can to ensure perpetrators are the ones to leave and that survivors should be able to stay safe within their own home whether that's social housing whether that's a privately owned home whether that's privately rented accommodation and then yes my role is working with private landlords and letting agents and other stakeholders to help them understand what their role is in that process so that if they do have a tenant experiencing domestic abuse they know how to support them and help them maintain their tenancy but also, sadly, you know, some survivors do still have to flee. They do still have to leave their home. They're still made homeless as a result of domestic abuse. And we know that with, you know, the shortage of social housing, um, many are having to go into the private rented sector as they flee abuse, either as temporary accommodation or as permanent accommodation, maybe after they've been in refuge for quite some time. And they need, um, they need access to those properties and landlords who are willing to take them on as tenants, considering um, a lot of what they've been through that might affect their you know, economic well-being, um, but also their ability to take on that tenancy and what they need to be able to do that and restart their lives and have a stable home for themselves and their children. And that's what my work really focuses on and hopefully what our conversation will be about today. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a real sort of change, isn't it, in, in approach for a lot of services, I think. So I think it's quite exciting. Should we start with what is domestic abuse and, and kind of and go into that and explain that for people? Yeah, I definitely think that in order to understand what's the link between housing and domestic abuse, you first need, you know, a foundational understanding of what is domestic abuse. Um, and I think the best place to start with that is the statutory definition of it that um, is recognized by the government. So until about a month ago, well, I think it was less than a month ago with the passing of the Domestic Abuse Act, there was no statutory definition of domestic abuse. Um, and now we have one. 
Um, and it's a really good starting point for agencies and professionals to understand what it is and who it affects. So if you just um, look at the definition, it says that domestic abuse is an incident or a pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive and threatening behaviour, violence and abuse between those age 16 or over. And that includes those who are intimate partners or who have been intimate partners, but it also includes those who are um, family members. Um, and it's not just talking about physical abuse, it's talking about, like it says, the range of abusive behaviors. So that includes um, physical, psychological abuse, um, sexual abuse, and importantly, that now includes with the statutory definition, economic abuse. So it used to be very much focused on financial abuse and how perpetrators might control money. Um, as a form of abusive behaviors, but we know it's far more extensive than that. And economic abuse is about controlling resources and access to resources. So they might not um, allow a survivor to have a job or hold a job. They might accrue rent arrears or debt within their name. They might have control over the bank account and deposit for your private tenancy. And those are all seen as forms of domestic abuse. Also, um, it's important to note that domestic abuse really at the heart of it is power and control so what the perpetrator is trying to do is have power and control over that victim and their life and they'll use a range of behaviors and tactics to be able to exert power control over their lives whether it's those forms of isolation and economic abuse whether it's psychological abuse telling them that you know they're deserving of the abuse that they're experiencing um, that nobody will believe them that only they will love them and if they leave they'll never have a relationship again um, all of those you know tactics are interutilized to to keep them isolated to keep them in a state of fear um, so that it's extremely difficult to leave that abusive relationship and although kind of society looks at physical abuse as the main form of domestic abuse, actually, it's just one of the tactics that's used alongside all of those to show what a perpetrator is capable of. So if you leave, if you reach out for help, if you try to become independent from me, I can hurt you, I can kill you, and I'm going to demonstrate that I can do that. And that really is um, what domestic abuse is, is the use of all those tactics to have power and control. Um, and anybody can experience domestic abuse. So it happens across every culture, every society, every socioeconomic background, um, every, you know, um, kind of intimate relationship, whether it's same sex or a heterosexual relationship. Um, and both men and women can experience domestic abuse. But it's really important that we do see that it's a gendered issue and that it's predominantly experienced by women and predominantly perpetrated by men. Um, and that domestic abuse is really prevalent. It's not something that just happens to a few people in society. It's, you know, one in three women experience um, domestic abuse, and that's about 35% of women worldwide experience some form of physical violence um, or sexual violence from an intimate partner. If you look at just, you know, England and Wales, each year 1.6 million women and, six, you know, 800,000 men suffer some form of domestic abuse. Um, and sadly, two women a week are killed um, by a partner or an ex-partner. And we know that number has gone up since the beginning of the pandemic and the lockdowns that have happened. Um, so, yeah, that... They're, they're horrifying very... numbers, aren't they? When you yeah, look they at... are. That, you know, it, and it's, I think the thing, everyone assumes it's something that happens to someone else. You know, I think unless people have encountered it, there's there's very much, a, oh, it doesn't happen to me and my friends. But actually, when you look at those figures, you, you know someone who's been affected, don't you? Yeah, you and, when, and when you start to understand what it is, domestic abuse, um, it makes you think, oh, I actually do know somebody who's experiencing mm. that. I remember when I first started learning about it, thinking back and being like oh a family member has experienced that but I didn't see it at the time yeah. so it's kind of only once you have that domestic abuse lens that you begin to see maybe in your own relationships or your family or your friends mm -hmm. or other people within your life but it's sadly it's everywhere it is but how does that link to housing because obviously we're here we're talking about property so how how why what where's that link to housing and what is it we need to think about there I mean there's many links to housing so First of all, you know, domestic abuse thrives because it happens within your home. So it happens behind closed doors where the perpetrator is not held to account, 
where the onus is put on the victim to tell somebody what's happened to her and hope that she is believed and to reach out for support, often the home where she might be isolated or, um, you know, actual captive within her own home. But also, like I said before, sadly, um, when a survivor has to potentially move on from that relationship or seek safety, they're expected to leave that home. Mm -hmm. And um, domestic abuse is one of the leading causes of homelessness amongst women. Um, and also, we know that there's a huge link between housing and domestic abuse as a form of abuse. Um, so we know that um, oftentimes um, antisocial behavior or what's reported as antisocial behavior is oftentimes actually domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets, you know, misidentified or misrepresented um, and not seen as that. Or we know that oftentimes perpetrators will accumulate debt and rent arrears in a survivor's name, which will lead to um, evictions, you know, inability to get new tenancies going forward. They might cause damages to the home as well. Um, you know, maybe as a, just a side effect of the physical abuse, but also as a, as a very purposeful tactic um, to make their housing insecure. Um, and we know that housing providers can be if they have a domestic abuse lens of that training, that awareness and understanding, they can see these things from that perspective and actually be the ones to spot the signs of abuse and have that conversation with the survivor who's a tenant and say, look, I've noticed these things have happened. I'm worried about you. You know, are you okay? Is your relationship okay? Is there anything that I can do to help? And there are very, you know, tangible things that they can do to support a survivor to maybe maintain their tenancy or um, do something to feel more secure within their own home, whether that's additional security measures and an extra lock or a lock change, um, whether it's negotiating with them about how you can deal with the rent arrears or maybe the perpetrators left the tenancy and they need a new one going forward. Can you actually work with the tenant to say, I'll give you a tenancy in your own name um, and that's fine. So there's, there's a lot that they can do. And we, you know, we know from the work that we've done with social housing providers, there's a lot of creative things they can do to help survivors get new tenancies when they have to um, leave an abusive relationship as well. Um, as a landlord, I kind of think, you know, I would be quite scared about having so, some of those conversations. That sounds yeah. quite daunting to start those conversations with somebody and say, is everything okay? It feels like it's stepping over a line and being a little bit nosy, doesn't it, somehow, you know, to your tenants? You know, how would you start those conversations, Deirdre? What would you say to landlords in those situations? Because it obviously has to be handled in a very sensitive way, doesn't it? And in a very careful way, if you're going to have these conversations. Yeah. I mean, if you're scared about nosing it in anybody else's business, I think, I think what we have to think about is that domestic abuse is everyone's business because it is, you know, it's a, it's a serious problem and people die. I know there's been one... Um, uh, case in particular that we reference quite a bit um, in our training with housing providers who are fearful of, um, I guess, asking the question or nosing in other people's business. But um, there was um, a man who was in social housing and he was neighbors with a woman and he could hear screams coming from her flat. He could hear things that were concerning to him. And um, he called up his dad and he said, I'm, I'm kind of worried about what's happening next door. It doesn't sound right. And his dad said, you know what? It's not our business. You know, just leave it alone. Um, and he did. But he was so concerned that he actually recorded it still. And the next day, that guy got um, a knock on the door from the police. And it's because the woman next door had been killed. And what he had heard was, you know, domestic abuse. And he had heard her being killed. Um, and I guess, you know, there's much more danger in not saying something than actually saying something. And a survivor can choose to, to disclose to you or not, and that's up to them. But all you have to do is make yourself available to them and say, I care, and I'm worried about this. Do you want to talk about it? I think obviously there are ways that we have to do that that's safe. Not doing it in front of the perpetrator, not, you know, doing it while they're alone. Um, and we offer guidance and support around how to do that. And we'll link to those resources um, from our website so that a landlord can um, have those. Also, I think it's important for a landlord to know it's not your responsibility to, um, I guess, make that survivor completely safe. You can talk to them, you can validate them, you can say, you know, it's not your fault and I'm here to help. You can offer to call the police if it's, you know, in a 
immediate risk or call the police if there is an immediate risk. But um, it's just being led by the survivor and what they want and what they need. And knowing that, you know, your role could, is very limited in how you can offer support and ask them what that is. It might be nothing. It might be just knowing that you've got a landlord who understands what's going on for you and isn't going to be judgmental or isn't going to think, ah, she's just a problematic tenant. I'm going to end that one and move on to a better family is enough for her to feel like she can um, do something about her situation. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question. Yeah, no, it but... does. I think I think it just, it just raises that that issue with landlords and makes people realize that they can have that conversation and just, yeah. just just starting the conversation is what where the power is isn't it I think really like as long as it's in a safe way and the perpetrator isn't around that they have that they start and then and they begin that conversation because sometimes it takes a long time for people to come to that realization people often don't recognize it as abuse in themselves do they when they're experiencing no. it you know so no it sometimes yeah. takes them a long time to get to that that recognition and that exactly. place where they realize it yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. And you're not going to do harm by, you know, in a safe way, inquiring about it. And it's up to them whether or not they, they tell you about that. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, but at least they know maybe next time that you are available and that you're willing to, to listen and, and support them within a reasonable way in your professional like remit and capacity. The other thing that was interesting that you'd said was about the antisocial behaviour and the way that that's sometimes mislabeled as antisocial behaviour when actually it's domestic abuse. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that and how landlords might sort of unpick that a little bit? I mean, just being aware that where there are complaints of antisocial behaviour, that there could be more to it than you actually think and that there could be domestic abuse there. And um, again, safely in inquiring about that with the victim if you are aware of who the victim might be I think before you get to a stage where you're you know serving an eviction notice or something like that um, just being aware that actually that antisocial behavior could be domestic abuse and having that at the back of your mind before you kind of take the next step um, really I think that's I'm trying to think if there's anything else to say I guess <laughs> Yeah. I was going to say, I guess also link, interlinked with that is about sort of increasing um, damage to a property. Things like that may also fit along there, would it? As a landlord, you know, if you've noticed that you're, you've got more, more damages that don't, that may be harder to explain in your property suddenly. Yeah, definitely. Holes in the walls, broken locks, um, damaged doors, kind of, you know, a repetition of those things is an indication potentially of domestic abuse and to, you know, again, safely inquire with, you know, the survivor in that situation and say, you know, I've noticed that, you know, you've had a few damages. I'm a bit concerned, you know, are you okay? Is there anything else you wanna talk about? Um, and again, it's not for you to solve those issues, but potentially just believing them, listening to them, thinking about, you know, how you can support them with that. I know we had contact with one landlord through an estate agent who had this issue happening and there were damages to the property. Um, and he was just really understanding and he had those um, damages taken care of, with kind of no questions asked. And that was just supportive for her um, to know that she didn't, I guess that that didn't put a risk to her tenancy or her relationship with the landlord because he was understanding of that. Um, so yeah, it's just being considerate of the fact that that could be the reason for the damages and safely having that conversation with them about it that's great um also you talked about it being a, you know domestic abuse being a big cause of homelessness um and that then obviously prompts what kind of property do people need what kind of you know where do people need to move on to what would you say about that yeah so um what we know about the private rent sector in particular is that Obviously, in a lot of areas of the country, there's shortages of social um, housing. And when someone is made homeless as a result of domestic abuse um, and they are seeking, in the first instance, temporary accommodation, an increasing number of survivors are placed within temporary accommodation in the private rented sector. But also, um, for instance, a survivor might have to go into a refuge, which is specialist um, accommodation for survivors of domestic abuse, where they can become safe and get some stability before they move on to permanent accommodation. Um, and again, we know that due to shortages in social housing, 
an increasing number of survivors are having to go into the private rented sector, which oftentimes they can find quite inaccessible, perhaps because they've suffered economic abuse um, and have had their resources taken from them. Maybe they don't have enough money for um, the deposit that they need maybe you know high rent um, maybe their credit history is quite um, damaged from economic abuse um, and they they find it difficult to enter into the private rented sector because of all of that and what we really need is is private landlords who have an understanding and awareness of domestic abuse and the impact of it and are willing to you know specifically take on um, tenants who have experienced domestic abuse who want long-term stable housing to rebuild their lives in but have you know landlords are a bit more willing to, I guess, be flexible when it comes to um, deposit, consider rent arrears, maybe um, acceptance of housing benefit. I know there's been a history of kind of landlords who are reluctant to take on um, tenants who have housing benefits. Just ones who, are, who know and understand what are some of the consequences of domestic abuse and willing to take on a tenant with that history and um, give them a stable home. You know, things like even a furnished flat is really uh, can be really helpful as well. If somebody's had to leave everything behind, go into refuge and then get new accommodation. Things like having a place that has carpet and appliances and a few beds and a sofa can be hugely beneficial to them because they don't have that extra income to just pay for those sorts of things. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I guess as a landlord, when you you know your your property becomes vacant, you have people apply to to rent your property. You don't know that that person applying for your property, they're not going to come with a large label around their neck saying, "I've experienced domestic abuse. No. Please give me a chance." Are they? I guess no. that's. And so they they're always and particularly while the market is so hot at the moment, it's you know for generally most landlords are, are letting properties very very quickly. So they they're yeah. you know it's they're choosing the, the best option of tenants you know they'll come with the ones with a good credit rating and the large deposit yeah. and the ones who have, have a full set of references and have everything together and so yeah. it, it's a big ask I guess of landlords to take a chance on people sometimes isn't it and you know yeah. I guess you know but I guess it's just making people aware and making people just think a little bit differently yeah and it's not something we expect all the landlords to suddenly do like forget about credit, forget about deposits, <laughs> forget about like, you know, a rent that makes sure that you have the income that you need. That's, that's not what we're saying. But we, we have had a few property investors come to us and say, look, I want, I want to do some good with the properties that I have. And I'm guessing that's why some of the people who are listening to this podcast are they have, they have these properties, they want to use them for social good. And what are some ways that we can do that? And we've just started to have conversations with these um, property um, uh, property owners about what that actually entails. You know, if, if you're going to actually use your property to provide um, housing for a survivor of domestic abuse, what does that actually look like in reality when you think about maybe some extra security measures, um, maybe a lower deposit, maybe not the best credit rating, maybe a furnished flat, but also no, you're not going to just wonder which people who are applying to have your property are victims of domestic abuse. It's a, it's a specially arranged setup where you have links to the specialist domestic abuse services in the area. You might have a relationship with the local refuge. People are ready to move on into permanent accommodation. They need private properties. They don't know which ones to go to. And we know, actually, you as a landlord are willing to take on someone who has that background. You have an awareness of domestic abuse and we're just starting to work with some property investors who want to take that extra step and do that so I guess no we don't expect you to do that as a as a landlord now but if that's something you're interested in talk to us because and, and watch this space because that's just some a model we're kind of looking to develop at the moment um if that makes a little bit more sense yeah yeah and that's really exciting isn't it it's about giving people opportunities but in a safe way where the landlords are protected a bit as well I guess that's what it comes down to isn't it so that you know yeah yeah everybody. yeah no and they're not expected to be some sort of specialist um Support provider they are just the provider of accommodation which I know is what um, supported living gateway is about as well kind of making that distinction between who the housing provider is and who the support provider is and there's no kind of overlap there yeah for everybody's safety yeah. yeah I think so I think it yeah it keeps everybody safe particularly with um some of the really vulnerable tenants that we're we're talking about you know who yeah absolutely do you have any other tips or advice for property investors anything else you think property investors need to think about at this point 
have we covered everything? I think just have an open mind that, you know, or see from a domestic abuse lens, maybe, you know, a tenant that you have might be experiencing domestic abuse when there might be some antisocial behavior or rent arrears or damages to the property. Think about maybe it's domestic abuse. If you just have concerns and you've got that niggling feeling that something's not right, and if you feel like it's a safe thing to do and one you can to talk to your tenant about maybe they're experiencing domestic abuse and saying, you know, I believe you and um, I can help you access some specialist local services. That's enough. Um, I think that's enough. And, you know, we'll continue to have conversations with you about our work developing going forward. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Deirdre. It's been great having you on today. Thank you. Thank you very much.